Hello and welcome to this uh, video on hypertension and cardiovascular risk assessment. This is from the Department of Family Medicine at RCSI Perdana and I'm Professor Anthony Cummins. This is quite a fearsome looking screen but a lot of content. We will go through what you see here and this will be underpinned by a clinical case to illustrate the underlying issues and practical management of hypertension, including its associated cardiovascular risk assessment through a range of risk scores, including Q-Risk 2. These are your learning outcomes. You should be able to, at the end of this video, perform a complete cardiovascular risk assessment on a patient with hypertension. You should also be able to outline the doctor's roles in preventing complications of hypertension. Let's look at the definition and classification. At its simplest, hypertension is that level of sustained blood pressure above which intervention with lifestyle and drug treatments does more good than harm. The level, level of pressure at which these interventions are worthwhile may depend on the patient's background risk. And this itself is due to several interrelated factors such as their ethnicity, their smoking status, the presence or absence of diabetes mellitus, dietary and other lifestyle factors such as salt intake, alcohol consumption, family history of premature coronary artery disease and hypertension, or a past history themselves of events such as a stroke, myocardial infarction or chronic kidney disease. The National Institute for Clinical Excellence in the UK devised in 2011 a hypertension pathway and this is now the current classification that is used for diagnosing hypertension. So according to that, stage 1 hypertension is where the clinic blood pressure is more than 140 over 90 and the ambulatory monitor or home blood pressure readings show an average more than 135 over 85. Stage two hypertension is where the clinic blood pressure is more than 160 over 100, and the average on either ambulatory blood pressure monitoring or home blood pressure monitoring is more than 150 over 95. Severe hypertension is described as a clinic blood pressure with a systolic over 180 or a diastolic over 110. Hypertension is common, it's often poorly identified and poorly controlled. It's a major risk factor, particularly for stroke, ischemic heart disease, chronic kidney disease, heart failure, cognitive decline in later years and premature death. According to the Irish National Audit of Stroke, the most common risk factors for stroke are hypertension and atrial fibrillation, and stroke being the third most common cause of death and the most common cause of acquired major physical disability in the country means that identifying and controlling blood pressure is quite important. In the INASC study in Ireland, the leading comorbidities in stroke victims were hypertension in 51%, previous stroke in 25%, and atrial fibrillation in 20%. This is an interesting slide also from Ireland, from publichealth.ie. What it shows is that those with clinically diagnosed hypertension in the previous 12 months and the percentage of adults age 45 and above with undiagnosed hypertension. And you can see as they get older, the salmon colored bars here shows the level of undiagnosed hypertension. So there's quite a lot of undiagnosed hypertension around and as doctors we need to be vigilant in screening and picking up those patients previously undiagnosed. You should use a validated <clears throat> automatic device and there's a list here from, if you click on this, on this link, hypertext link, there's a list to the British Society of Hypertension, a list of validated machines. When you see blood pressure being measured in clinics, it often is not done in this fashion, but this is how it should be done. 
The patient should be sitting and should be resting for 10 minutes before the blood pressure is checked. For elderly and diabetics, you should check the blood pressure sitting and standing to identify orthostatic hypotension. The environment should be quiet. The doctor or nurse should not be speaking to the patient at the time of measurement. The arms should be supported at midpoint to heart level and the cuff size should be appropriate for the upper arm circumference. According to the NICE criteria, if the clinic blood pressure is more than 140 over 90, you should offer ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Many GPs in Ireland have ambulatory monitoring and there is a service provided by the blood pressure unit at, at St Vincent's Hospital for interpreting ambulatory blood pressure recordings. When you're using ambulatory monitoring, make sure that at least two measurements are taken per hour during waking hours. And there should be uh, at least 14 measurements taken during this time. For home blood pressure monitoring, each recording, there should be two consecutive measurements taken at least one minute apart with the person seated and the blood pressure should be recorded twice daily ideally in the morning and evening and blood pressure recording continues for at least four days ideally for seven days the advice given is to discard the measurements taken on the first day because they may, may show a white coat effect and use the average value of all the remaining measurements to confirm a diagnosis or not Ambulatory monitoring is superior to home blood pressure measurements. And it is now recommended that nobody should have a diagnosis of hypertension made without having an ambulatory measurement performed. Let's look at an ambulatory monitoring reading now. This shows the diurnal circadian rhythm that you see. So at night time, the pressures drop down. This is systolic, this is diastolic and it drops down at night, and this is called nocturnal dipping. Some patients don't show a dip, they're called non-dippers, and this is significant because it's related to uncontrolled hypertension and the likelihood of developing increased complications such as uh, left ventricular hypertrophy and stroke, and also may be an indicator of underlying secondary hypertension. So ambulatory monitoring is very useful in excluding the white coat effect, in diagnosing borderline hypertension, deciding on if treatment is necessary in elderly patients because you don't want them to suffer more harm than benefit. So if the drugs cause them to fall over, for example, this could be very detrimental. So you need to be as precise as possible in elderly hypertensives about the diagnosis. You can also identify nocturnal hypertension the non-dipping, which, as I said, is an indicator of likely complications. You can also use it to assess so-called resistant hypertension. You can also use it to monitor and determine the efficacy of drug treatments. It can also be used in high pregnancy hypertension and also to diagnose patients who have hypotension. The targets for ambulatory monitoring in those aged under 80 is less than 135 over 85 and over 80 less than 145 over 85. What about white coat hypertension? Is this important? It's very common. Um, it is thought, it was thought to be due to stress and anxiety, but it isn't just that. It seems to be related to the mere fact of somebody else putting a cuff on your arm. This causes changes in markers such as cortisol and adrenaline and so on, and that raises the blood pressure. So is it benign? It appears not totally benign. It's somewhere in between uh, normal tension and hypertension in terms of lifelong risk. Another aspect to look at is about um, variability in blood pressure and also maximum systolic pressure. But these are strong predictors of stroke independent of the blood pressure, especially in patients with previous TIA. In your overall assessment, you must include elements from the history, examination and investigations, and also make an inquiry about medications that could be 
interfering with the blood pressure readings. Usually, hypertension is asymptomatic, but occasionally patients have headaches or visual disturbance. You should check about past history of vascular events because that raises the risk profile and also lowers the threshold at which you would introduce treatment. Check for a social history, particularly smoking, alcohol, exercise and diet, and especially within diet, sodium intake. Check for a family history of hypertension or of stroke or other vascular events or heart failure or renal impairment. Check the blood pressure in the manner described. Calculate the BMI. Look for evidence clinically of end organ damage. In the heart, you may have a loud aortic second sound. You may have a displaced apex beat. You may have a right ventricular heave. And on looking on fundoscopy, you might find evidence of hypertensive retinopathy. Baseline investigation should include full blood count using these creatinine, random or fasting glucose, lipid profile. Urinalysis is very important to pick up proteinuria and blood, which may indicate an underlying renal cause for the hypertension. And an ECG is also mandatory to look for left ventricular hypertrophy. An ECG is more reliable than a chest x-ray to uh, assess cardiac size. Ask about use of steroids non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, caffeine intake, amphetamines and other recreational drugs that could interfere with high blood pressure. In, in women, uh, check for the contraceptive pill and also over-the-counter cough medicines and others which can act as symptom emetics. So always check your analysis, always do an ECG. Here's an ECG showing left ventricular hypertrophy with very tall QRS complexes and the T-wave inversion indicating left ventricular strain. Let's look at this case now. This is a 55-year-old man who attends the symptoms of a lower respiratory tract infection. He's not attended you in the past two years and he feels generally well. His blood pressure today is 180 over 95. His heart rate is 80 per minute and regular. He feels it is high because he is stressed at work and at home recently. So what do you do? First of all, repeat the blood pressure, check both arms, ensure the cough size is correct. Is he sitting comfortably? On the repeat checking, it's 160 over 90. So now let's start building up a picture of risks. Calculate his BMI, ask about smoking, ask about cholesterol and family history of vascular events. Ask about any regular medication use non-steroidals etc ask about his alcohol consumption and ask does he add salt to his food on further questioning he tells you he smokes 10 daily and has done so for the last 20 years his brother had a myocardial infarction in his early 60s and his father a stroke age 77 his bmi is 35 and he's never had his lipids checked you decide he needs further investigations, so you arrange an ambulatory blood pressure monitor for him to confirm his hypertension. You send urine for an albumin creatinine ratio. You dipstick the urine first of all for protein and blood. You arrange an ECG in order a chest x-ray and these other bloods. On review, on the ambulatory blood pressure monitor, his mean pressure is 145 over 90. He's 55. His albumin creatinine ratio is normal. His total cholesterol is 5.8 with an HDL of 0 0.2, which is quite low. His estimated GFR is more than 90. His use and ease are reported as normal, as is his blood sugar at 4.6. His ECG shows sinus rhythm with no LVH, and his chest X-ray shows no cardiomegaly. Do you diagnose stage 1 hypertension? So what is your management plan for this man now? Okay, we'll come back to him later in the video. What are the benefits of hypertension? What is the point of treating blood pressure? Well, there's huge evidence from the 1950s onwards that you can delay, reduce or prevent complications through targeted blood pressure control. Or you can reduce the likelihood of stroke, renal failure and heart failure. The effect on ischemic heart disease and myocardial infarction is less, but there is still a benefit.
and controlling blood pressure for that reason also. You should encourage a healthy lifestyle based on sound evidence, so low salt intake, reduced alcohol consumption, smoking cessation and regular exercise. What is the impact of lifestyle changes on blood pressure? Does it matter? Well, yes, it does. You can reduce blood pressure, systolic blood pressure, by up to 3 millimeters by restricting salt. Weight loss can reduce it by 5 millimeters and exercise up to 2 millimeters. Smoking cessation doesn't appear to have any effect on blood pressure measurement, but has other benefits, so it should still be um, suggested. There's a particular diet called the DASH diet, looking at dietary approach to stop hypertension. This is a diet low in saturated fats with an increased consumption of fresh fruit and vegetables. And this appears to lead to a reduction in systolic pressure of 11 uh, millimeters thereabouts and about 5 in diastolic. So that's quite significant. This is a pressy from a JAMA paper on the DASH diet. The NICE pathway outlined for hypertension is, again, always offer initially uh, lifestyle advice and then continue to offer this periodically to patients whose blood pressure may not be adequately controlled. The following may be helpful. And what are the criteria for starting antihypertensive drug treatment? Well, patients aged under 80 with stage 1 hypertension plus one of the following should be offered medication. Evidence of target organ damage, previously established cardiovascular disease or renal disease, type 2 diabetes, and those with a calculated 10-year cardiovascular risk equivalent to 20%. You should offer treatment to people of any age with stage 2 hypertension. And what medication should you use? What are the choices? It depends on the racial background. If the patient is aged under 55, you should start with an A drug, that is an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker. If they aged over 55, are they black, that is of African or Caribbean origin, not Indian or Asian, you should start with a different drug, a calcium channel blocker. This is step one of the NICE pathway. Step two, if the blood pressure is not controlled to target after three months, you should then combine these drugs. After another three months, if it's still uncontrolled, you should then add in a further drug, a thiazide-like diuretic, for example, in dapamide, or spironolactone, or you may also use, in place of these, an alpha blocker, such as doxazosin. At this point, if your blood, patient's blood pressure remains uncontrolled, you should be checking concordance, inquire again about their alcohol consumption and salt intake, but if it remains uncontrolled, you should then be referring for expert advice. There's a whole range of drugs that are available for hypertension. They all have adverse effects. It's important to be aware of these so that you can counsel your patients. This is a list of the major drug groups, thiazide diuretics, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, alpha blockers, and angiotensin receptor blockers. The major problems with thiazide diuretics are the uh, metabolic effects on potassium and sodium. This is important in elderly patients because hyponatremia can lead to falls and sometimes thiazide can have a profound effect on the blood pressure itself leading to postural hypotension which in itself can cause falls. There may also be sexual dysfunction and problems with urinary continence so be aware of this uh, in your elderly patients. And there may also be glucose intolerance of gout. The commonest side effect of beta blockers is fatigue and tiredness. They also get insomnia or cold peripheries through blocking of the reducing of the cardiac output and bradycardia. Asthma is an absolute contraindication for beta blockers, but COPD is not. Obviously, patients with heart block shouldn't be given beta blockers. It may worsen dyslipidemia. There may be some concerns about patients with peripheral vascular disease. The commonest, com the commonest adverse effect of ACE inhibitors is a dry, persistent cough. There's also concerns about a first-dose hypotension, but this is very rare. Uh, this originally was noted in the 1980s when the first ACE inhibitor was made available, Captopril, but the doses then were huge by comparison to today's doses. It was common then to have doses of 150 milligrams three times daily. 
you may get a dysgeusia or taste disturbance and rarely people will get angioedema. ACE inhibitors and ARBs are contraindicated in young women with hypertension who may be pregnant because they are teratogenic. And also if somebody has renal vascular disease, you need to be very careful. And if, for example, a patient's creatinine doubles when they start an ACE inhibitor, it's good grounds to withdraw the drug. Calcium channel blockers commonly cause constipation and also you get flushing and headache and ankle swelling. They're relatively contraindicated in heart failure by cardiac infarction. Alpha blockers may cause postural hypotension with ensuing dizziness. And ARBs are of a similar profile to ACE inhibitors, except they don't cause the cough, but they can also cause the angioedema. And also for patients who have very poorly controlled hypertension, if you combine ACE inhibitor with ARBs, you may get an increased effect on the blood pressure with severe hypotension and worsening renal function and electrolyte upsets. This applies probably more to heart failure patients than to patients with pure hypertension. Now, so once you diagnose the patient and instituted treatment, you don't have to go on managing them and monitoring them. You should have definite targets and the patient should know about this and be given a cooperation card with their target blood pressure on it and their BMI and so on, so you can help them to aim for achieving target. They should have an annual review with their blood pressure, their blood, the ECG, urinary ACR, and an adverse drug event uh, inquiry is made. You should manage all comorbidity. This is very important in the overall outcome. And you should also treat other risk factors for the same reasons. When should you refer to secondary care? When should patients with hypertension be referred to hospital? Well, clearly those who have severe end organ damage, who have secondary hypertension or resistant hypertension. These tend to occur more in patients with truly resistant hypertension. There are many more common causes of um, uncontrolled hypertension that we'll deal with later. So what if it's not controlled? Well, the most common reason is it's been inaccurately measured. The cough is the wrong size. The patient is obese and the cough is too tight. <coughs> Excuse me. There may be a white coat effect. There may be that they're suboptimally treated or that they're not taking their treatments. There may be comorbidities. They may be still taking lots of salt in their diet, consuming excessive alcohol, or there may be underlying secondary hypertension. So before you diagnose secondary hypertension, you should consider all of these others first. Malignant hypertension is a hypertensive emergency, and thankfully these are rare, but they are severe and life-threatening, and usually associated with blood pressures in excess of 180 or 120. There are two major clinical syndromes, malignant hypertension and hypertension, hypertensive encephalopathy. This is where the blood pressure is 180 over 120. There are hemorrhages and exudates or papilledema, and there may be renal involvement. The hypertensive encephalopathy you have all of this plus signs of cerebral edema due to breakthrough hyperperfusion from severe rise in blood pressure. This is a medical emergency. These patients need emergency hospital admission. They need very frequent blood pressure checks, strict bed rest, and the blood pressure should not be reduced too rapidly because of a fear of the risk of cerebral infarction. You should aim to reduce the systolic to 110, sorry, the diastolic to 110 over 24 hours. In, in, uh, uh, along with hypertension itself, we also need to assess these patients' overall risk. And because cardiovascular disease in Malaysia and in Ireland is a leading cause of premature death and a major cause of disability, then it's very important to be able to assess your patient with hypertension's risk of developing such events. There is now huge evidence supporting the benefits of statins in reducing cardiovascular risk, and NICE has now recently lowered the threshold for intervention from a 10-year risk of 20% down to a 10-year risk of 10%. That's only a 1% annual risk. There are several calculators available to help us to assess our patient's cardiovascular risk. And these are, this is the original, the Framingham score, 
is also curious curious to assign score and is also the british joint british society's coronary risk prevent uh, coronary risk predictor it probably does not matter too much which score chart you use what's more important is that you use one at all it's very difficult to assess cardiovascular risk without doing this you don't need to do this in patients with already pre-existing disease such as diabetes cardiovascular disease with moderate or severe chronic renal impairment and moderately raised single risk factors like total cholesterol more than eight or systolic pressure more than 180. in other patients with hypertension it can be used for determining the risk overall So some patients will have their risk underestimated by these score charts because they have additional risk which is not picked up by the, the, the score chart. So people treated for HIV, people with serious mental health problems, people taking medicines that can cause dyslipidemia such as antipsychotic medication, corticosteroids or immunosuppressants, people with autoimmune disorders such as systemic lupus and other systemic inflammatory disease such as rheumatoid disease. Let's go back to our clinical case. You remember he came to you with a lower respiratory tract infection and you found his blood pressure was raised. You repeated it, it was still up, but not as high. You checked on history taking and found a few other relevant risk factors. You decided he needed further investigation and you performed an ambulatory blood pressure, which showed this uh, systolic and this mean blood pressure 145 over 90 and the various uh, results you can see there so how do you manage him now so take some time to reflect on that and how you would what medication you would give him what health advice you would give him what lifestyle advice you'd give him curisc 2 takes account of some other factors uh, other than the standard risk factors um, including uh, ethnicity uh, postcode, um, whether there's chronic kidney disease or not, whether there's atrial fibrillation or not, whether they're already on treatment or not, and whether they have rheumatoid disease or not. So this is an example where this patient had a Q risk 10 year score of 20%, whereas a typical person with the same age, sex and ethnicity would have a score less than half of that. So this patient needs a statin and he is prescribed a torvastatin 10 milligram plus diet and lifestyle advice, which is in accordance with the NICE guidance. So who should be offered a statin? All those on Q risk 2 with a risk of over 10%, <clears throat> all type 1 diabetes, all type 1, uh, type 2 diabetes and Q risk more than 10%, all chronic kidney disease. All those with a prior vascular event should be given statins of prior cardiac events, stroke events, or peripheral vascular disease. Statins can be used in the elderly. There's good evidence up to the age of 80, but beyond 80, it's unclear because there's lack of trials in this age group. The guidance from NICE is to beware of factors that make treatment inappropriate. We can treat up to 85. All of those with familial hyperlipidemia should certainly get statins and they may need additional treatments also to reduce their cholesterol. They should also have familial genetic testing and they should also be offered high potency statins such as a torvastatin, 40 milligrams. There's probably no need to test fasting. There's a little variation in total cholesterol and HDL between fasting and random. The evidence now is overwhelming. This is from a Cochrane review of three years ago strong evidence to support the use in people at low risk of cardiovascular uh, disease. You can look at the uh, NICE guideline here on the familial hyperlipidemia in this link. For dietary advice, patients should be offered whole grain varieties of starchy foods. They should reduce intake of refined sugars in food products containing those, including fructose. They should eat at least five portions of fresh fruit and vegetables per day and two portions of fish per week, including a portion of oily fish. They should have at least four to five portions of unsalted nuts, seeds and legumes per week. They should be advised to take regular exercise, at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity, 
uh, activity or 75 minutes of vigorous activity or a mix. They should perform muscle strengthening exercises on two or more days a week. Men should not regularly drink more than three to four units per day. And in fact, recently in the UK, the guidance on this has come down. It used to be 21 units per week, but now it's come down to 14. And it's also gone down similarly for women. All patients who smoke should be advised to stop. Yeah, we've covered this already, so we won't do that. Statin monitoring, however, is an important aspect. Patients, especially elderly patients, often have multimorbidity and therefore have to endure polypharmacy. So we need to make sure that there are no drugs that are currently taken that interact with statins, such as clarithromycin, some calcium channel blockers like amlodipine, um, grapefruit juice and some supplements. You should, before you start a statin, you should check their LFTs and just make sure that they haven't had any uh, persistent generalized unexplained myalgia. But check a baseline liver function test, AST, ALT particularly. You no need to check the uh, creatine kinase as a baseline. And then you should check the liver enzymes at three months and 12 months, but not again unless clinically indicated. If however, they do develop muscle aches while on a statin, you should then check their creatine kinase because um, this may be an indicator of developing myoglobinuria. If the creatine kinase is five times the upper limit normal, then you should stop and get specialist advice. If it's less than that, it's rarely clinically significant. It could be due to exercise. But you should continue to monitor and repeat this in a month. If the patient turns um, intolerant to statin, then you should stop and reassess off statin. If symptoms are no better, you should try reducing the dose or changing to a lower intensity statin. Myalgia is certainly more common in some groups, such as the elderly, those taking high alcohol consumption within the first three months of starting statins. And also consider other causes apart from statins. For example, in an elderly patient, could it be polymyalgia rheumatica in a younger patient? Could it be acute viral illness? Check also for drug interactions. There are various guidelines available for lipid management and statin initiation. This is the clinical practice guidelines from the MOH here in Malaysia. There is various guidelines from Ireland, from the UK, um, European score risk charts. You can look at these yourselves in your own time. This is from the Oxford Mini Handbook of uh, Clinical Medicine. Uh, some sheets for you to look at. This is simply just uh, repeating what we said already, but you can look at these in your own time. This is about measurement of blood pressure, again, using the correct cough size, etc. And this is looking at deciding if somebody's got hypertension or not based on their repeated measurements. This is looking at treatment goals and lifestyle changes. This is looking at drug therapy with some uh, evidence showing the benefits of drug therapy, uh, which kind of drugs you should begin with and what combinations of drugs you should use. We've covered this already. And that gives different drug dosages and ranges and so forth. And again, there's a section on malignant hypertension and hypertensive encephalopathy. And this is showing an ECG with left ventricular hypertrophy. Now let's look at hypertension in pregnancy. This is a particular issue. Pregnancy hypertension may be associated with proteinuria and or edema. And this is a, if that's the case, then you're talking about preeclampsia. This is a major syndrome and it's quite important to, to predict. And even though death in pregnancy is rare, the few women who die in pregnancy nowadays there's always some who die from preeclampsia that's not been considered or hasn't been picked up. This is a multi-system disorder which begins in the placenta with a primary defect uh, as a failure of trophoblastic invasion of spiral arteries. The risk factors for preeclampsia are chronic hypertension, hypertension in previous pregnancies, are women with pro, a previous uh, chronic kidney disease or diabetes and underlying autoimmune diseases such as uh, lupus, rheumatoid and so on.
The important thing in preventing preeclampsia is to be aware of it. Check blood pressure regularly. Always dip the urine. And if the patient has symptoms and it persistently has raised blood pressure, a urinalysis showing proteinuria and palpable edema, then you should refer urgently. It can be mistaken for other things, and this is one of the reasons why it may not be picked up. It can mimic the flu, so you get headache or chest or epigastric pain, vomiting. But there may also be visual disturbance, sometimes described as like looking through frosted glass. There may be shaking, hyperreflexive irritability. These are very late signs. At this point, this woman is now in danger of generalized seizures, and treatment must be immediate because this is a very severe development and death is usually not far away once a woman develops eclampsia. You can look at this in your own time. I mean, this is uh, about specific management for early phase of hypertension in pregnancy and managing with severe preeclampsia. And it goes on further to the management of seizures and so on. And finally, this is one um, screen showing three sheets from the Oxford Pocket Book for Paces, published in 2012, on hypertension. You can look at this again in your own time. Here are some references from the Nice Pathways Cardiovascular Disease Prevention, links to the Oxford Handbook of General Practice, various other guidelines like the SIGN guideline, uh, a reference to the Quick Medicine app, which you probably all have now, um, and the link to the Nice Guidance app for uh, Apple devices and Android devices, and also to the uh, Clinical Practice Guidelines of the Ministry of Health in Malaysia on Cardiovascular Disorders, which includes hypertension.